Taking sides, watching the upcoming debate might make all the difference if you're one of the undecided. Shaky seats, investigators search to find what's frightening flyers on American Airlines. And tailgating time, it's a different kind of Hunger Games before the team hits the field. I'm Angela Monteria. And I'm Lauren Simpson. It's Tuesday, October 2nd, and in Utah, it's 12 o'clock. From KBYU and the BYU Department of Communications. This is the award winning 11 News at Noon. The first round of presidential debates starts tomorrow night, and while some voters are rooting on their favorites, others will decide who to cast their vote for after the debates. 11 News reporter Elisa Kleinman explains how big of an impact these debates could have. This Wednesday, President Obama and Governor Mitt Romney will face off in their first debate. Some voters are proudly showing who they already picked as their candidate. So it's a combination for me of President Obama being so, being so great in his policies, in my opinion, and also that he's much better than the alternative. But experts are saying if either Obama or Romney make a mistake explaining policy, it could end up costing them the coveted spot in the White House. If either one of them makes that sort of a mistake, then I think that that, that could actually change some people's minds. While some people who come here to register to vote already know who they'll vote for, a recent poll showed that 20 percent of people could still change their mind. In an ABC News Washington Post poll, one-fifth of voters supporting either Romney or Obama describe themselves as persuadable, meaning they don't support their candidate 100 percent. Independent is like how I'm going into this election. I just kind of go into anything open-minded, just trying to see like both sides Persuadable voters like Reisner could be very influential in swing states like Ohio and Florida. And it's those people who haven't made up their mind who have the ability to tip the outcome one way or the other. In Provo, Elisa Kleinman, 11 News. The ABC poll that sh shows that voters under the age of 50 are the group most easily persuaded during this year's election. New polls show that Mia Love leads Jim Matheson in the race to win Utah's 4th Congressional District. Love now carries a 49-43% to 43 edge over the six-term congressman. Matheson had a commanding lead last June, but Love's GOP ties and emerging popularity helped her pull off a 21-point swing. Both candidates hope to make their last push with only a month left before final voting. GOP candidate Mark Crockett says he'll return more than $5,000 in fundraising money. The Salt Lake County Democratic Party filed a complaint against Crockett, accusing him of accepting donations over the county's $6,000 limit. Crockett's campaign manager says there was a misunderstanding of fundraising rules and the money will be promptly refunded to donors. Homeless people are pushing back against an American Fork City ordinance that bans panhandling. 11 News reporter Matt Rascone has the story. In a similar case with Salt Lake, the city argued the ordinance was for public safety purposes. I spent some time on the streets in American Fork and met a homeless man who says panhandling is his means of survival. Close your eyes and I'll close mine. Darren Curtis spends his entire day outside singing, walking, and standing at this corner. I'm just trying to. Get a few bucks so I can get a hotel room. Homeless, jobless, and struggling to get by. A small apple, some water. That's all Curtis has eaten since yesterday. All right. Once in a while, you know, somebody will drop you a sandwich or something. For Curtis, this is more piece of cardboard. It's his way of living, but American Fork doesn't support it. I've got tickets before. A city ordinance bans panhandling which makes it illegal for Curtis to hold up his cardboard plea. It allows complete discretion on the part of police officers to simply use it to target people whose speech they don't like. Golan is representing homeless man Steve Evans, who is suing the city. The hope is that he can go back and do what he does to survive. Fortunately for Evans and Curtis, a federal judge named a similar ordinance unconstitutional in March. I'm not going up to people and personally asking them, hey, can I get a dollar? Back on his corner, Curtis does what he can to survive. I stand here, I hold the sign, they can give me a buck or they can't, or they don't. 
American Fork City attorney is still reviewing the case and had no comment, but the city agreed to place a temporary restraining order on the ordinance, which means it won't be enforced uh, while the case is pending. So for now, people like Curtis can continue their way of living. Thanks, Matt. And a two-month a two-month-old infant is not expected to survive after abuse from her great aunt. Medina Osman is charged with two counts of second-degree felony child abuse. Officials say the baby suffered brain hemorrhaging and rib fractures from violent force. She's currently on life support at the Primary Children's Medical Center. When 11 News at noon returns. Water wreckage. A crash in Hong Kong waters has officials scrambling to rescue hundreds from the waves. And pumpkin. Search and rescue teams worked for more than six hours last night to free base jumper hanging by his parachute in Provo Canyon. The jumper chute snagged on the side of a cliff, leaving the 26-year-old dangling on a 200-foot ledge near the mouth of the canyon. Rescuers released the man from his chute and lowered him to an ambulance below. Doctors say the man suffered minor injuries, but is in good condition. Two fishermen are injured after a shrimp boat caught fire on the Great Salt Lake. The fire started when the two men were making repairs to their boat offshore from Stansbury Island. Sparks from the work ignited gas fumes and surrounded them with flames, severely burning one of them. Authorities say the other man suffered minor burns and was released at the scene. A passenger ferry in Hong Kong kills 38 people. Thailand prepares for heavy rain before monsoon season. And Italy is using canines to sniff out tax dodgers. Here's your look at news from around the world. Hong Kong authorities are investigating the collision of two passenger ferries that killed 38 people. Police say the two boats crashed into each other at full speed on a night that was more than more crowded than usual. Government officials managed to pull 123 people from the water and police say they will continue to search for missing passengers. They're not sure what caused the crash. The threat of monsoon season in Bangkok has made officials prepare for extreme flooding. Experts say they expect swamped roads from heavy rain this weekend, so volunteers are helping to clear canals and unblock sewers. Officials say they hope to prevent a repeat of last year's flooding. Italy's finance police are using canines to sniff for drugs not to sniff for drugs or explosives, but cash at airports. Officials say the four-legged friends search for euros, dollars, pounds, and rubles in the bags of traveling passengers. The government say the dogs will prevent smuggling and tax evasion. And that's your look at news from around the world. Lauren? Thanks, Angela. Drivers always have to keep an eye out for deer this time of year. And now it looks like skateboarders might have to as well. A 17-year-old from Colorado hit a deer going 40 miles an hour on his skateboard while zooming down Lookout Mountain. Ironically, the downhill race he participated in is nicknamed Blood Spill. The deer broke his fall, and besides some road rash, the skater and the deer were both okay. Flying can be a hassle, but one thing you can usually count on is a secure seat. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case for some American Airlines passengers. Two Florida-bound flights were grounded last week for loose seats. The forecast is cloudy for one of the nation's largest employers as American Airlines continues to struggle after announcing thousands of job cuts last month in an attempt to avoid bankruptcy. The recent loose seat problem is just the latest flap that has passengers fed up have any options unfortunately you know and it's, fly, right? it sucks because you have to pay so much money for these flights the airline is conducting an internal investigation to figure out what went wrong with these seats 10 planes are currently under inspection in REL, the air is feeling crisp and the leaves are changing colors but it still doesn't feel like fall do you think we'll get any autumn weather soon Ho oh, ho, we're in for a big surprise tomorrow might need to bundle up a little and put on those coats and scarves but your 11 news weather was And it's a beautiful day here in Provo. As you can see behind me, we have some clear blue skies above the mountains and some nice sunshine in the valley. Um, we are we're going to be hitting 81 degrees today with some calm winds, so it should be really nice. Um, what we're standing at currently, we're 57 degrees with a humidity about 55% and about 3 mile per hour wind speed becoming east-southeast. Um, what to expect tonight, we're going to be 
50, about a low of 53 with a calm wind speed about six miles per hour be coming east towards the latter part of the evening. So today we're going to have some warm temperatures and then tonight it's going to be not too cold but a nice clear sky over the night. A little breezy too. Um, um, Wednesday, actually, this Wednesday we're going to be experiencing some really cool weather. We're having a cold front come in and ex probably from the systems that we've been seeing in the northern part of the United States. As a pocket of the warm weather, weather is pushing through, behind it's going to be um, a cold pocket of air that we're going to have some gusty north winds tomorrow. And that will probably go through the, um, that will probably exit the state through <laughs> at the one end of the weekend. But today, um, throughout the state, we're experiencing some fairly consistent temperatures of the sun. Um, Vernal at 78, Moab at 84, and St. George at 93. We've have, we have St. George at 93 at the beginning of the week, but they may be seeing some cooler temperatures throughout the rest of the week, just not as, as extreme as we're seeing there. But Southern Utah five-day forecast, like I said, 93, 91, and then we're going to be in the 80s throughout the rest of the week with some clouds and starting tomorrow for St. George. And then the Northern Utah five-day forecast, we're going to have some sun and then start to see some cloud coverage towards the latter part of the week. And then, like I said, that dropped to the cooler temperatures starting tomorrow, 15 to 20 degrees cooler than our highs that we've been having recently. So some typical, more typical fall weather that we haven't been seeing, but we're going to start experiencing. So like I said, 69 and 39 tomorrow for our lows. But today we're going to be up at 81 and 53 tonight. And then for the weekend and our homecoming game, 66 and 39. And so a little bit of a cooler weekend, but it's going to be the football game. And I think people don't necessarily want those extreme temperatures. So we'll have an exciting time for the homecoming game and some better average temperatures. Okay, some good weather. Thanks, you can Arielle. grab some hot chocolate, you know, That's bundle right. up a little bit for the game. It's not too bad. Right, because this week we have a football game and then next week is homecoming, so we're looking forward to that for sure. Sean, how's our team doing? Well, after that Hawaii game, they're definitely back on track and in fact, we have some fun news to, to show you also about that homecoming game next week, but also next on Sports Lone Star Meltdown. It was one-sided turnover fest in the showdown in Texas between the Bears and Cowboys and then game day grilling. One group says if you're going to the game, get there early to get some grub. Sports. The BYU football finally has a winning record, but they still can't match the success of three other fall teams that are all in the top 25. Men's cross country is still the top ranked Cougar squad, holding steady at number three after winning the Bell Bill Dellinger Invitational over the weekend. And women's soccer isn't far behind, jumping up to number six. And they open conference play this Friday against Santa Clara. And then women's volleyball is undefeated no more, dropping to 16th after falling for the first time this season to St. Mary's. And plans for next week's homecoming football game against number 14 Oregon State have been finalized. The matchup between the Cougars and Beavers will kick off at 1.30 p.m. and the game will air regionally on ABC. BYU also announced that the game will be a blackout as fans are encouraged to wear black. And then the Cougars will debut new black uniforms as well. But before the beginning of any football game, fans are lighting up the grills before heading to the field. 11 Sports reporter Jason Ludlow has the story. I visited a group of local and loyal BYU fans who showed me how they are trying to create a true tailgating culture here at BYU to improve the game day experience. Food, friends, and more food. These are the key elements to the college football tailgate. Fans across the country unite hours before kickoff to sizzle some grub and have a good time. Even for visiting fans, it's an essential part of the game day experience. Uh, I think everybody should tailgate who comes to the games. Family and friends and just having fun and enjoying each other and then going to enjoy the game. But limited land and parking problems make tailgating at BYU difficult. Brian Mace and members of CougarCenter.net started a movement to find a solution. They use podcasts and Twitter to reach out to BYU administration to find a place to accommodate grills, tents, and RVs. Uh, we set up a few meetings, uh, you know, just gave our, our input, let them know what, what works, you know, here at the ground level so they could understand, you know, what we need to make it, uh, you know, positive and work out for everybody involved. 
Their persistence paid off in BYU Open Lot 54, just two blocks north of the stadium, for RVs and overnight tailgating this season. May says they are building a true tailgating culture at BYU. Grab yourself a tent, a cooler, some chairs, and come join us. It's always a good time over here. Everybody's welcome. If you're hungry to tailgate, the Cougar Center crew will be up and running Thursday night in Lot 54 before BYU showdown with Utah State on Friday. Thanks, Jason. And it was a Monday night battle between two inconsistent quarterbacks as the Bears and Cowboys squared off in the Lone Star State, and one of them had a game he'd rather forget. The long night started for Tony Romo late in the second quarter as he throws a perfect pass right to Bears cornerback Charles Tillman, who took it to the house, and the Bears went up 10-zip. And things got even worse in the second half as Romo gets hit right here in the back and you'll see the ball pop straight to linebacker Lance Briggs. It was Romo's third pick of the night, his second pick six, and he turned around and throws two more to the Bears for a total of five interceptions as the Bears beat the boys 34 to 18. And Indianapolis Colts first Indianapolis Colts first year head coach Chuck Pagano will miss at least the next six to eight weeks as he undergoes treatment for leukemia. Pagano felt extreme fatigue since training camp and a checkup this last week led to the diagnosis. Offensive coordinator Bruce Arians will take over coaching duties while Pagano is out. And with, two days, and with two days left in the MLB regular season, the playoff picture is starting to clear up, but there's still a few races that could go down to the wire. The Detroit Tigers wrapped up the AL Central with a win last night, but the other two divisions are still wide open. Baltimore trails the Yankees by one game, and Oakland is only one back of Texas, but both the Orioles and A's have clinched the two wildcard berths. And then on the NL side, there's only one race still running, as the LA Dodgers still have a shot to take the last wildcard spot away from St. Louis. The Nats, Reds, and Giants have all clinched division titles, and the Braves have that top wildcard slot as well. And you've also got some some basketball starting up within a month. In fact, the Utah Jazz opened their training camp today. Oh, that's exciting. To get ready for it. They've got some fresh faces, some new blood, so we'll see what happens as they get ready for that season. I can't wait for basketball season. I grew up playing basketball, so it's my sport for yeah. sure. Awesome. I have to agree with you there. <laughs> the Jazz are looking good. Yep. So they come on 11 News at noon. Gigantic Jack Lantern. This pumpkin is a dream come true for any Halloween carver. We'll be right back with this farmer's pride and joy. James's giant peach might be the world's most famous produce until now. Massachusetts farmer Ron Wallace is now the proud owner of a 2,009 pound pumpkin, the heaviest of all time. The record setting vegetable was a labor of love for Wallace. He won more than $15,000 for his gargantuan gourd. It was a proud moment in pumpkin growers history as Wallace rejoiced in the arms of his fellow pumpkin growers at the Topsfield Fair. The prize was lovingly named the Freak Two after its seed came from the 1800 pound Freak One. Regardless of how you name it, one thing's for sure, this pumpkin is freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is one giant pumpkin. It is huge. I wonder what they're going to do with it. I mean, think of all the pie that could come from that thing. That's true. That's 11 News at Noon for Tuesday, October 2nd. Thanks for joining us.